Hello, everyone. My name is Ari Javadan, and I'm the program coordinator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Welcome to the latest presentation in the NCTRC webinar series, uh, Integrated Patient Portals and Improving the Virtual Experience. Today's webinar is hosted by the California Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, these webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs, and they are presented on the third Thursday of each month. Just to provide some background on the consortium, uh, located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national, one focused on telehealth policy and the other on telehealth technology assessment. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. Uh, a few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted for today's session. Please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, please note that closed captioning is available and is located at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is also being recorded and you will be able to access today's and past webinars along with a PowerPoint presentation on the NCTRC website. Uh, and with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we are joined by three representatives from Ocean, Allison Pierce, uh, user-centered design specialist, Rob Kay, technical program manager for digital patient engagement, and Tyra Brown, improvement, advi improvement advisor. And with that, I will pass it over to Aislinn Taylor, program specialist for the California Telehealth Resource Center. Aislinn. Okay, thank you. Uh, All right, everybody see my screen? Good. Hey, thank you for being here. Um, we, I am uh, Aislinn Taylor from the California Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, we're super thrilled to be hosting today. Um, just a reminder, uh, as usual with the uh, Telehealth Resource Centers, all information uh, presented today is just for informational purposes. We do not have any relevant financial interest arrangement or affiliation with anything mentioned in today's uh, presentation as we are the CTRC. Um, and I will hand it over uh, to the speakers for the agenda. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Tyra Brown, an improvement advisor at Ocean. And so I'll just go over the agenda for us. So today our agenda consists of reviewing the hybrid virtual care models. We're going to talk about the benefits of the patient portals, the trends of the high-performing health centers that we're seeing. Um, some of the, we're going to do a virtual visit overview. We're going to talk about the future of virtual visits and how you can make changes to your patient portal um, with patient-centered solutions. And we will close out with any questions that you might have. Next slide. And I think we've done the introductions, but just to do them again, uh, we have Robert Kay, who's a technical program manager at OGEN. I'm Tyra Brown, the improvement advisor at OGEN, and this is Allison Pierce. She is the user Center design specialist at OGEN. So in the last few years, um, we must say care delivery has gone through quite a transformation from nearly 100% in person to nearly 100% virtual during the lockdowns of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic provided a safe, safety imperative for providers and patients to pivot to virtual options. It accelerated by cooperation from payers and regulators. So this public health emergency offered us an ideal test case to demonstrate the potential for virtual solutions to complement in-person care in ways that expanded clinical capacity, improved continuity of care, and dramatically increased access to quality care, particularly for those underserved populations. So the experience also understood the need to design future hybrid care models with an eye to health equity so as not to exasperate the digital divide. And we did that a lot of times because we saw that patients were really liking the virtual care options and a lot of healthcare centers want to implement that into their framework. So as a general rule, states and private payers take their cues from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And under the COVID-19 public health emergency, CMS lift, lifted many burdensome restrictions of telehealth and expanded the number of allowable services that may be administered virtually. It is yet to be determined if these temporary provisions will be permanent, but the prevailing thought is that CMS will extend the parity. Um, so the goal for healthcare is a seamless patient experience, right? This, that 
um, we want to make sure that people that patients don't don't really have a difference between in person care and virtual care. Evidence shows that clinical effic efficiency, sorry, patient preference and value of virtual care options will allow patients and providers to choose the most appropriate virtual care options at any given point in the patient care journey as a new standard of excellence. So let's go a little bit deeper into what that may look like. Next slide. So just from one, what we experienced during the pandemic with a lot of us going 100% virtual, several data was pulled and it showed that patient portals, um, increased patient portal efficiency in the patient portal experience. We saw this with the pandemic. Many, patient, many patients used their patient portals to review their COVID-19 test results and to review education materials on the symptoms related to the virus. So virtual care also increased during this time and some patients were able to message their providers, submit questionnaires and remotely track biometrics like daily blood pressure and or glucose. So reminders and alerts help patients to learn more about preventive care and how to manage an upcoming patient visit. Next slide, please. So studies found that patient portal adoption in general is, is correlated with <clears throat> is correlated to increased patient engagement. It improves patient retention. You have higher rates of up-to-date preventive care and better health outcomes. So a Pew Research study found that low-income patient populations are more inclined than affluent populations to use smartphones to access the patient portal and manage their health care. Other studies similarly found improved compliance with medical advice and medication instruction among patients who use patient portals, particularly those with chronic conditions such as asthma, congestive heart failure, and type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. So here are the market trends. As I mentioned earlier, patients really did like having access to their care during the pandemic. And it showed in the data. I mean, at OGEN, we looked at a lot of the patient portal usage and activation rates, and it showed an increasing, it, it showed an increase. And that has remained steady even now. Um, so statistical data shows that with our, with our OGEN data, we use Epic MyChart, and it showed that 31% of patients ha have a MyChart account. 40% of patients have been, who have been seen three plus times this year have a MyChart account. And the mobile app will become the majority of users soon. And that's probably about 40%. That's what the trends are saying. And so additional highlights from the study show that about six in 10 individuals nationwide were offered access to the patient portal and nearly 40% access that, that their record at least once in 2020. So nearly four in 10 patient portal user Users access their patient portal through a smartphone health app in 2020. Individuals encouraged by their healthcare provider to use their patient portal, access and use the portal at higher rates compared to those who did who were not encouraged to do so. Next slide. And there's benefit not only for the patient, but for the um, for the healthcare setting as well. So data shows that. Um, the patient portal, portal and virtual care does not just benefit the patient, but the health center. So an Athena Health study found a positive correlation between greater portal adoption and patient pay yield. Practices that increased portal adoption by 20% over 12 months saw a median increase of a patient pay yield of nearly 5%. and portal adopters are more likely to have ongoing relationships with their providers. According to network data, 30% of portal users make at least one annual visit to a primary care provider in a three-year time span, compared to just 19% of non-portal users. I know when I was looking at a provider for uh, pediatricians for my kids, I, I looked for, I only looked for pediatricians that had a portal because when you have kids, you have questions that are normally outside of business hours. So that was a huge factor. And we're seeing that trend in data as well. Next slide. And so what we're seeing is increased patient portal usage not only helps patients, but it helps the staff as well. 
Um, practices with portal adoption rates above 60% report that portals can reduce workloads for providers and staff. Patients are able to utilize the portals to, um, to accomplish a task that would normally require a phone call, such as a prescription refill, request appointments. So this allows staff to focus on patients who have the most urgent needs and questions. So patient portals allow registration forms to be completed electronically prior to appointment check-in, keeping front office work efficient. Now we saw this a lot during the pandemic. A lot of, um, a lot of providers would make you do a lot of the um, check-in work in your car and then you would come in when you were, when you've completed everything, you'd go straight to the room. So we saw that a lot with a lot of our providers. And this actually translates into cost savings for the practice and improved care delivery for patients. Increased portal adoption and virtual care options allow providers to put a greater focus on patient care. Providers can use the portal to easily access and share patient information electronically, which allows them to provide a higher standard of care. Also, studies show that patient portals better, better the, the patient and physician relationship. Think about it. If you have 24-hour access, access to connect with your provider and ask them questions, as I mentioned earlier, that's one of the benefits that I liked about the portal, and I was able to review notes, and make, that makes the physician and provider relationship even better. Um, and as you can see, there are a host of benefits. As you can see, there are a host of benefits that, a host of things that benefit the medical provider which makes people really need to take advantage of the patient portal. It, it offers better communication, elimination of paperwork, unrestricted electronic access, better relationships, improved outcomes, and an, an optimized workflow. So as the industry continues to transform um, into like shared risk and diminished reimbursement. Healthcare organizations have a significant opportunity to manage these issues by growing portal generated revenue, right? So by increasing portal generated revenue, organizations can deliver more efficient, more care efficiently and redirect staff and resources to higher margin services. There are four primary ways to accomplish this. You can deliver a, great, a greater variety of services of services, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then we'll talk about, and then as well as enroll more members and improve the patient experience, which we've already discussed. You capture patient responsibility because you provide a lot of education materials and preventive materials through the portal, and you can align to current promoting interoperability measures or PI measures. So one of the things that I kind of haven't mentioned is patients with chronic diseases such as hypertension or diabetes can now use um, Bluetooth enabled devices to upload blood pressure readings or blood glucose levels um, via the internet to the patient portal. So this technology enables clinicians to remotely monitor conditions in near real time and make adjustments as the slightest change in a trend, at the slightest change of a trend. These remote monitoring activities may be reimbursable under federal, state, regional, and or payer guidelines. We already discussed how patient portals um, tend to increase the um, patient, patients with portals tend to pay their medical bills faster. And then we talked about um, the COVID-19 public health emergency lifted, which made a lot of restrictions on telehealth um, uh, go away because it was expanded and number of allowable services that may be administered virtually increased. Next. So I just want to go over a few things. So what Ocean did recently, oh, well, sorry, during the pandemic is we looked at it like, what were the trends of high performers? What were the ones, what were the characteristics of health centers who utilize their patient portal on a regular basis? And here's what we found, right? Um, they normally have a diverse patient demographic. So, and that it ranged from um, different incomes, um, but yeah, they just had more of a diverse patient population than those who did not. And then we also looked at, they had more functions enabled. So uh, one of the main things I think you're seeing through my presentation is, you know, it's the more functions you have available for a patient to actually use, um, the better. And then finally, the length of time with, with the patient portal was also big. And we assumed that this was because they have established workflows and processes in place, such as maybe they have different workflows in order to sign up a patient. Maybe they have um, 
maybe the patient portal is promoted more with the staff. And so, it, uh, patient, so patients are encouraged more to kind of utilize the patient portal. And if it's also promoted with the medical staff, it's for us like, yeah, if you need another medication refill, just use the portal, that type of thing. And our patient demographics also kind of noted that, um, you know, English speaking patient populations um, were most of the users of the patient portal. Um, and also patients that were 20 years old and higher um, actually activated their patient portal a lot more as well. So data shows that between seven and nine patient portal features enabled, enabled increases patient portal usage. So on average, each additional um, patient portal function that you have enabled is associated with like a, we noticed like a 3.9 increase with our patient portal. And um, as we look closer, the impact of specific functions on activation rates, we found that the payment function enabled is also associated with an 8% higher activation rate. We also found that health centers with higher activation rates tend to be using a secure text messaging platform as their me mechanism for patient text and outreach. While on average, health centers and customized trending and implemented have higher activation rates than those who have not implemented it. So there is definitely benefits in customizing your patient portal to fit your health center. Uh, we mentioned this point before, but yeah, I think I just want, we want, wanted to stress, you know, having the payment function turned on was huge. And then it goes a little bit deeper into some of the patient functions that we said. Um, having these functions enabled on your patient portal actually increased usage. And it was the auto instant activation, the virtual visits, um, prescription refills, uh, fast pass, and then direct scheduling. And those are the my chart pictures that we looked at. So next slide. So this is just like an overview of some of the things that I've mentioned in the presentation today. So we talked about how the increased patient portal usage and activation actually not, so, not only benefits the patient, but it, in a, in, it impacts the staff as well as the health center. So for the patients, they have access to their health info 24 seven, they can do look at upcoming visit reminders, um, they have a proxy access when they have small children, and then it's vaccine proof. And then for staff, we talked about how it reduces no-shows because patients have more access to their um, information, uh, fewer no, fewer fewer phone calls because a lot of stuff is streamlined through the portal. We reduce mailings that way as well, and less time at the front desk. And then with the portal, you have easy check-ins, e-sign forms, e-sig forms. So a lot of your um, check-in forms, administrative stuff is kind of done before you get in the back. And then you have online bill pay. Um, you can cancel, reschedule online and online test results. And, have, and I think I just really wanna stress that, you know, when you as the patient have more control over your data and how you see it, when you see it, I think that only not only benefits your patient, but like I said, the staff and your health center as well. Now I'll turn it over to Rob K to go over virtual visits. Sure thing. Thanks, Tara. You covered a lot of ground there. Um, there's there's so much to talk about here. And I know it's also preaching to the choir. You guys are on a telehealth resource network webinar. So I know a lot of that might have been review, but I know I, I got some tidbits out of it. The component where just having more features on leads to greater engagement feels really intuitive, but having those hard numbers on the 8% higher engagement with bill pay is, is really powerful. And I appreciate your team doing those studies. Uh, I want to dwell for a moment on, on virtual visits and the, the way that they interact with the patient portal itself. Um, that, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought around this. One is doing it separately. You know, we've used Doximity. I mean, you could even use FaceTime um, and just that ability to have that interaction with the patient. But I do want to encourage uh, and, and solicit uh, feedback uh, from, this, from this webinar around using the patient portal itself as the access point. Uh, because essentially that leads to more use of the tools and streamlines all of your functions. And it makes it uh, almost parallel to a clinic visit. 
So, you know, obviously we, we make sure your tool is HIPAA compliant. We use Zoom, but that ability to do that e-check-in, um, everything from confirming demographics, sending out questionnaires ahead of time. Um, you can even gather some of your meaningful use numbers, like sending out PHQ2s and PHQ9 questionnaires. Um, and gather the insurance cards. Many portals have the ability to uh, take a picture and send that in as part of it for so you can run your RTE in the background. Um, and uh, basically, it's, it's try and get that data entry done ahead of time by the patient when they have that moment of calm before they're sort of waiting and nervous. Uh, and, and that's one of the big advantages of virtual. I also encourage working through the portal because of the technology check challenges. I know we've all been uh, COVIDing and on Zoom 9,000 hours a day for two and a half years now. But for some of our patients, they aren't uh, as tech savvy. They don't hit it as hard every day. Um, it's always, you know, the first visit is the hardest. Um, and so being able to do that tech check to ensure confidence in the platform can be really powerful. And that's hard to do with kind of a separate uh, separate video visit technology. Um, using virtual visits, and this is preaching to the choir, uh, is uh, it, it's an, an equity push because patients, uh, especially those with 12 hours a day jobs, with children in multi-languages, um, it's a lot of work to come into the office. So encouraging those virtual visits where you can, where it makes sense, where you have translation services available. And I know that's a huge sticking point for many of you. There are uh, services you can buy that will send a translator on, or you can even, you know, just speakerphone in one of your standard translation services uh, for those video visits. But being able to support those patients who otherwise may not be able to come in. Um, and uh, group visits are surprisingly powerful. Uh, I know we we use my chart primarily here at Ocean. Um, and so there's the ability to add additional people to your call. Um, often that will be the primary caregiver. So for example, if grandma is sick, having their, their child uh, get on the call with them to take notes, et cetera, can be very useful. Um, or even back to that translator flow. Um, and finally, that like basic logistic of patient needs to click on the link to get in. You know, having that inside of the patient portal is useful, but also most tools you'll see have a, a button that just sends the text to them again. And time and again, that ends up being useful, even if your patient portal, uh, our, again, in our case, has uh, push notifications or uh, ticklers, and I'll just call out the ticklers is one of the worst terms in technology, uh, but those are text messages or emails that are sent to remind the patient to come in. Sometimes just that text message uh, can, can get them coming in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and we've hit on some of this already, uh, already um, but managing that waiting room is another component. I know uh, that your providers never run late, that they're always 100% on time, nothing ever comes up, but for some of ours, they can run late. And so having that ability for an MA or another staff member to pop into that virtual waiting room to reassure the patient, whether that's just texting them or sort of in that online chat, uh, or face-to-face -face can be really powerful and reassuring. Um, so that's another reason to do this through a portal. Um, and the other is to set the expectation that communication will happen through the portal, especially for after the visit. So if there are uh, activities that you need the patient to complete, whether that's uh, refilling a prescription, whether that's bill pay, whether that's entering their own biometrics, or really the biggie is sending that after visit summary um, so that the patient can see what you talked about. Uh, when you do that visit through the portal, that becomes incredibly easy for the patient because it's the same place and sort of that mental model uh, is in play. Um, and those after visit summaries, I know many of you have done big pushes to make sure you attach that to every visit. Um, you know, uh, it's often very easy, maybe too easy to add too much content to those. And that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but the big advantage that I've seen in those is the uh, avoidance of white coat syndrome, which is, uh, for better or worse, all of you providers on the call are terrifying. Um, and that means that patients often aren't holding on to all the information you tell them. And not everyone has uh, the wherewithal to bring a notepad or to bring in another person to take notes for them. 
So enabling the after visit summary uh, to get to them easily with those clear action items within that same portal is incredibly powerful and can boost, uh, again, you guys know this, but it can boost compliance with the care plan. Next slide, please. All right, I wanna take a sort of a step back um, and look at kind of you know the crystal ball and where, where healthcare tech is going and the different levels here. Uh, and one, one, uh, one tip I, I received in a previous life was that healthcare, healthcare technology is five years behind banking and 10 years behind travel. So if you think about, you know, I'm based in Portland, Oregon. So what Alaska Airlines is doing uh, 10 years ago with, you know, the check-in kiosks, building a mobile app, reminders, um, or, and then with banking, you know, I use USAA. So what they've been doing online with the ability to scan checks, open accounts, interact over chat with support, that provides a really helpful framework for seeing where we are going with this. Um, and I know each of you is in different parts of the country, but I encourage Alaska Airlines. It's a heck of a great uh, user interface. And I know that we're, we're poaching some of their components. Uh, where we see healthcare technology going is there's this cascade of interaction points that are increasing the level of effort from the clinical team, where sort of level zero, for better or worse, is going to be Dr. Google, um, which we, we know leads patients astray frequently, but we need to acknowledge that that's kind of many patients' first entry point. And so encouraging them to interact with you or at least a trusted resource before they go off and learn from WebMD that they have cancer um, is a very effective tool. So within those patient portals, having whether that's CRAMES or another tool available that you can encourage and education, educate patients to interact with. So that's sort of the first tier. Then, and that's that patient self-serving. Then there's messaging. Um, so this is, uh, I know, a, a it's kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to patient portals. Providers, especially in FQHCs, often have no admin time allocated. It's unreimbursable, and it can feel like a complete onslaught of, of messages that you're doing in your pajamas till 10 p.m., and that's real. There's workflows that you can develop as a, as a system to support that, whether that's having pools analyze, uh, you know, having the nurse team or MA team scrub those ahead of time. Moving as many of those systems online as possible is another big tool. So if many of the questions are around uh, scheduling or bill pay, encouraging patients to do that ahead of time. Um, and frankly, educating the patients about what messaging is for uh, can be hard the first time and pays off. We've seen uh, some, some uh, health systems will actually drop a dot phrase onto their AVSs, those after-visit summaries, uh, where if a patient's been abusing it, uh, the messaging, then it encourages them to do it a different way. And the final one was a, a study at the University of, of UPenn um, where they called it the let me upgrade you flow, uh, where if a patient has more than three interactions over messaging on the same issue, the provider is encouraged to upgrade them uh, to a visit. Uh, and that keeps those messages from, from drawing out. So we're cascading down from Dr. Google to the trusted in-house house resource to messaging. Then there's e-visits, which are pretty underused. Um, these are, whether through Epic, that's called e-visits. There's vendors such as BrightMD. But these essentially walk patients through that same algorithm that your nurse practitioners or, or uh, PAs are running on low acuity issues. Do you have a cough, a cold? If yes, are you running a fever? Um, and they, they walk through those and gather those from the patients while they're at home without having to come in, without using provider time. They'll then consolidate those patient answers, put them in front of one of your providers who can review their answers, ask the patients follow-up questions, and prescribe very quickly. So we see some providers able to treat these low acuity common issues in two minutes because, frankly, it's, it's, it's following best practices. So again, we're cascading down through more and more options. Then we hit virtual visits. So obviously, you guys are very familiar with this. It keeps the patients in the home. Uh, we've seen that patients who connect for virtual uh, often have shorter visits because they tend to be more targeted, um, for better or worse. Um, but I know that when you know when you're in in with your patient in person, and you say, "Is there anything else I can help you with?" The answer is almost always, 
oh yeah, also this massive thing that I didn't mention and should probably be an extended visit in three more, uh, you're now trying to tack on to the end. And we have simply seen a theme with virtual visits that, that doesn't happen. Now it's important that those patients get those seen and treated, um, but there's, there's an option to do that uh, at a later date or to extend it. The virtual visits tend to be more targeted. Um, and then finally, almost as a, a, a last resort, again, this is in the future as we cascade down, do you have an in-person interaction with the provider? Obviously, when you need to do biometrics, if you need to take vitals and the patients don't have a device, you know, the laying on their hands is still a key part of healthcare. Um, but only do that when you need to. Um, and so again, bringing back in that banking and travel idea, I don't know about you guys, but the last time I interacted with a teller in person, I, I think I was nine. Um, you know, the, that doesn't happen all that often, let alone a travel agent in person. Now, again, they aren't trying to take my pulse, but you can see where, where the industries are heading and the ability to move many of these things online, make it much more convenient for the patients and much more efficient for you while still making your patients feel connected and heard by you, their provider, because they're gonna go somewhere else if they can, if they see something more convenient. You know, your Zoom cares, your Providence Express cares are offering virtual visits for a flat rate of $49. Um, and if you can't see them for two months and the patients have some resources, they might go that route. So providing these options keeps them in-house and uh, is, is what we see as the way of the future. All right, that was my long diatribe. I want to hand it off to Allison Pierce, who's our expert on how to actually build these things and build them right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rob. Yeah, to close this out, I just want to make sure that um, we have some time carved out to think about designing the right solutions to meet your patients' needs. So not just the technical features, not just the capabilities um, and the functions that are going to get the patients to the care, but thinking about the experience that you want to create holistically. And certainly from a patient perspective, you know, I can speak for myself, myself as a patient. Um, always what I'm looking for is what's going to be the easiest, what's going to be the most streamlined and seamless for me to navigate as far as, you know, accessing my healthcare, like Rob had alluded to some other um, experiences that are really moving to that more digitized um, space. And what are the tools and resources that are available to make things easy and seamless for me as the user or as the customer, um, as the patient. And so as you think about building your solutions for your patient portal. Um, I just want to encourage you all to think about the human experience. So from the perspective of your patients, you know, as, as humans, as people who are, you know, navigating the unknown or trying to care for a loved one or, you know, friend or family, um, what are the needs and the actions of those individuals, not just from a technical perspective, so making sure that the apps are available and they can search the, you know, app stores to find or they've got technical guides available, um, but, you know, thinking about the, the ease and simplicity of something. And um, as people are thinking about other industry standards, what works well and what, you know, what are the drivers for success within other markets and other industries that are digitized that you might want to mimic and um, consider for your users. Um, also thinking about co-designing. So collaborating with representative samples of end users, whether that be family caregivers, patients themselves, different demographics, different, um, you know, care considerations. What are the needs that they have is in order to you know, build that impactful experience? How do you think about um, you know, different perspectives from individuals who need language and translation assistance, individuals who need assistance or are gonna use um, adaptive devices when they're engaging with different digital tools? So um, having those perspectives at the table as you're designing your solutions is gonna be really important. And then also making sure that you're getting feedback at every stage of your journey. So if you're an organization that's really focused on um, just thinking about developing and deploying a portal, um, you know, asking people from the start, have you come from an organization or a healthcare organization that had a portal? What worked well for you in the past? Um, what are some things that you think would be really important to be able to accomplish outside of, you know, the brick and mortar building that we have here um, that you'd like to see online or available to you um, versus individuals and you know who are part of an organization and receiving care through a more robust portal. Um, a lot more features and a lot more innovation is available um, the more you invest in developing your portal. And so also gathering end user feedback from that stage and thinking about, you know, 
um, integration of remote patient monitoring and other devices and things that um, might be a little more mature and advanced than those early stage development. Um, so just making sure that all along the way as you continue to iterate and grow that you're um, asking for feedback from your end users. Um, and then a core principle of user-centered design and design thinking is really focused on that kind of test, learn, and iterate. So you're, you're always thinking about how to improve on what you've done and making sure that you're always moving towards the next stage and um, validating your findings across the, the lifespan of the project. So just making sure that that is key and fundamental to, you know, not just one stage of um, portal design and implementation, but that you're always looking for those areas of improvement. You can run through your, you know, plan, do, study, act cycles, or, you know, working through your improvement science methodologies to make sure that um, everything is, um, you know, continuing to grow as your users um, develop more needs or, you know, needs change along the way. Next slide. All right, and I think that closes us out. So, um, I don't know if we're open for Q and A. Yeah, let me uh, give voice to some of the the written uh, questions and give you guys time, uh, attendees, to please submit some more while we answer these. Uh, anonymous attendee asks. Uh, is best practice to make e-check-in for video visits mandatory or optional pros and cons? Um, this, of course, varies by health system, your workflows, your platforms. But my recommendation, what, what we've seen effective is to turn on e-check-in, uh, and depending on your platform, it's called something else, but basically the entry of information prior to a virtual visit. Um, turn that on, but make the fields optional. Um, obviously, your, your front desk would love them all to be answered, uh, as would we. But what we don't want to do is, is throw up barriers to care. Um, there's also the challenge that uh, for at least Epic, um, if a patient doesn't complete e-check-in, then no information comes across. So it's, a, it's an all or nothing binary, which is problematic, but the way it's built. Uh, so my, my recommendation is to turn it on, uh, gather as much information as the patient is willing, but enable them to skip uh, fields. Um, the Richard uh, asked, is Zoom the only virtual visit platform supported by Ocean Epic? Um, no, we have three in our stable. We have Microsoft Teams, which I don't encourage. Uh, we, are, we built in a hurry uh, during COVID. While it is functional, it lacks uh, any advantage over Zoom. Um, as you can tell, Zoom is, is certainly the industry standard for, for most uh, platforms. Uh, we do also support Doximity, which is a, a powerful tool as well. And uh, despite all, all of that pitch I was giving about making sure you have visits through the platform, I know you can't always get patients signed up through my chart. And Doximity is a powerful kind of end run around that. It's a dialer that sits on your provider's uh, desktops, and they can just punch in the patient's phone numbers or email and connect without any further uh, hassle. Um, and then uh, this might be a question for you, Iceland. Uh, I wanna know if there's a separate webinar that's dedicated to asynchronous uh, codes and services uh, as part of the CTRC work. You may have stumped us on that. Uh, so we'll, we can get back to you. I don't believe there's anything on the book specific to async. Yeah, I'm, I am not sure what is upcoming in the NCTRC uh, webinar um, calendar. I think Aria did respond, um, but I would say if you're looking for um, specific codes, please reach out to um, us if you're in California or not. Um, please reach out to uh, your telehealth resource center. Um, if it's not CTRC, you have a regional um, one that I'm sure would be happy to help you with um, codes and services. Um, yeah, the TRCs do cover a variety of topics uh, for virtual care, um, so I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. But I believe Aria dropped a link um, to respond to that question. Great. Thank you, Aria. Uh, JD Moore asks, and Allison, then will be coming to you, uh, do you come across pac patient experience hurdles with MyChart customization? If so, what are the workarounds? That's a good question, Rob. Maybe we can tag team this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there certainly are hurdles that exist as far as patient experience goes, and you know we're we're doing um, 
doing our best to make sure that we acknowledge some of that. As far as workarounds go for customization, that I'm not quite so sure about. Um, yeah, I can I can jump in a little bit there. So some of the, the biggest hurdles that we see with my chart around activating about getting patients to actually sign up um, is, you know, some of it is cultural, there's, there's reticence to share information, there's, um, you know, we don't want, you know, I don't want my doctor up in my business. Um, but often it's, it's technological. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a scary amount of work, even though it is not. Um, but for those who aren't tech savvy, my parents included, I consider my my mother my ultimate beta tester. If I can get her to use a tool, then I have succeeded. I'm one for nine. Um, but the uh, the best way to solve that is with, and it's it's hard because it's resource in intensive. It's with hands on support from uh, your front desk or your MAs. Um, the uh, the other solution I've seen is pretty creative from. Uh, some of the clinics we work with is to staff a genius bar, uh, so to speak, but they do it with high school volunteers over the summer uh, because those uh, no one needs to train a 17 year old on how to download and install an app. Um, and they also make it a priority with their staff and make sure they're resourced for it. Um, anything else to add on that, Allison? No, I think you're spot on. Got it. Um, I see another question coming in around portal language. So uh, the ubiquitous uh, anonymous at attendee asks, we have seen portal language translations as a big barrier. Epic Foundation has some content translated, but any custom text in the organization to translate. Thoughts or future path forward? This is one that I have good news, um, at least within the Ocean portal. And of course, this varies by what platform you're on. I know that most health systems are looking, looking at multi-language um, and obviously within the FQHC network, this is huge. Um, but within the Ocean Epic Mic Chart, uh, we are currently live with English, Spanish, uh, Vietnamese, Russian, and traditional, or sorry, with simplified Chinese. Um, and that would be for uh, all static texts. So essentially, uh, you're not gonna be able to get, not yet, all of the messages, for example, when a patient writes a message, uh, we don't have the tech to translate those. While the tech exists, uh, boy, howdy, is that a massive legal liability to be translating uh, medical information. So someday. Um, so what we see most clinics do is they're staffing translators, or many of them are hiring from within their communities they serve who are bilingual and can support the providers when those messages come in. Uh, again, within Ocean Epic, we are adding additional languages, uh, including uh, Somali, Arabic, uh, Haitian Creole, Nepali, um, which is, we're very excited to be getting those up and running. Again, that's static text only. Um, and I encourage you guys to, in the next two months, uh, that'll be going out in our July release. Um, log into your MyChart, uh, turn on in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little drop down for uh, for language and switch it to Arabic. Uh, not only is it a, a beautiful script, but from a technological standpoint, it reads right to left. Uh, and so it flips the entire website uh, to, to be right to left. But that's just sort of an interesting technical anecdote. Uh, I am not seeing any more uh, questions in the q and A. I I want to give people a couple of seconds to, to add more and then turn it back over to Aria. Thank you, Rob. Thank you to all of you. It was a very informative presentation. Um, I'm just going to bring up our last closing slides. Uh, there we go. Just a reminder that our next webinar will be held on Thursday, June 16th, and that will focus on Association of Telehealth and Financial Performance of Rural Hospitals. Uh, registration information is available on our events page of uh, the consortium website, telehealthresourcecenter.org. And lastly, we do ask that you take a few short minutes to complete the survey that will pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very valuable to us. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, Tyra Brown, Rob Kay, Allison Pierce for their presentation today, and to the California Telehealth Resource Center for hosting today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.